very much, uh, Laura, and um, welcome everybody. Uh, that's a terrific list of participants with more people joining. So, of course, we'd really prefer you are all here with us, but it's very nice to have you here virtually. This is um, a new type of event for us. This is a virtual event that's a confluence between a conservation artist and conservation scientist. So we hope you'll enjoy this. It's my great pleasure to introduce Deborah Mitchell to you. Um, Deborah first came to Archfold in 2016, and you're going to learn a lot more about her. Um, she came um, and really fell in love with field stations, and not just Archfold, with other field stations around the country, for which we are extremely grateful. She's done. You should check out her website. She's done book projects, directed um, an amazing artist and residency program, Airy, in the um, artist and residence in the Everglades, um, based in the Everglades. Glades National Park, but she brought those artists to Archbold, uh, I think, uh, on different field trips, and we've really enjoyed their company. And having Deborah here has lifted us in many ways. Um, you know, one of the wonderful things about working with artists and scientists is this confluence of observations and creativity and curiosity and the sort of wonderful concept, uh, conversations that stem from that. And I'm hoping there'll be a little bit about that today. And it's really uh, given us an opportunity to reach new audiences, give new opportunities um, for audiences to learn about us and for sparkling new sort of exciting um, conversations. Um, today, uh, we're going to go through, a, I'll let Deborah introduce the program, but we're going to see a lot of our work from South Florida. She's going to connect that with other observations. She's very interested in wild observations and connectivity, connectivity of place, connectivity of people, connectivity of concepts. And um, I think before I steal any more of her show, I'm going to hand over to Deborah, ask her to do her introduction, and then lead us off to the rest of the program. And um, hang in there as an exciting new start for us. We're, we're very happy that you joined us. And, and share your chats and your, th share your, share your thoughts in the Q&A. We want to answer your questions. So over to you, Deborah. Thank you, Hillary. Can you all hear me? Is this a good sound check? Well, good afternoon. I am just delighted to join this team and share some of my work and experiences with all of you today. Um, this is going to be a really special Zoom and something super outside of the box for Archbold because there are multiple little videos that we're weaving together with um, transition times with brief chats and all sorts of artwork interspersed. So you may have to have patience with us if we uh, need you to, to pause a little bit as we transition. I do believe, um, Margaret and Laura, that we were going to show the Florida Stewards video. Yes, why don't we roll that and then I'll come back and talk about that. Here we go. My name is Deborah Mitchell. I'm a visual artist based in Miami Beach and my practice really focuses on the environment and using that practice, using the cultural arts to kind of interpret the environment and bring it to the public. I've been really interested in the ranch lands. So taking a course, I was learning a lot about the upland systems and the habitats, how they really work together. And that's why in the last several months, I've been working on um, the, the types of flora and fauna that, that we're going to find in ranch land. So I tried to take, you know, things that would grow, the, um, the, the St. John wort, the tar flower, the caracara, I still need to finish in the corner there, and just really kind of pay homage to these, these animals that have been grazing the area for so long. In the case of textures on the skull, um, You'll see this, this area on the top of the snout is very kind of shiny and smooth. So that was really easier, there you go, to make these small lines and get different shaded effects. The zebra long wing uh, butterfly, the, the state butterfly, the blazing star has a lot of detail. So I could do that here and a little bit on the sides too. But when it came time to work up here, it's just much rougher, even if I sanded it. And I didn't get the same effect on here. You can see the Saranoa repens right here. The same effect that I wanted down here for detail. 
I mean, when it comes to conservation in Florida, there's it's just such a big topic, and I think that the public doesn't really understand. My name is Deborah Mitchell. I'm a visual artist. Curate small exhibitions out there, bringing different for my practice. After my son was going to kindergarten, I mean, I had been drawing and painting all along, but it became more of a purpose for my passion when he went to school. And that's when I applied for a residency in Big Cypress. So at the National Preserve, there is a, a park program where you can go and stay for a month. And to me, that was like the backstage pass to find out more from the rangers and the scientists about um well for me it was very interested in endangered species so it was about looking for panthers and ghost orchids and trying to photograph them so that when i get back to the residency at night i had something to refer to um and i've been keeping journals all along like this one that i'm working on now from archbold right so the pictures were like a springboard for me, a memory tool to draw and paint and make collages. So that seminal experience in Big Cypress rolled into other things. I started to um, curate small exhibitions out there, bringing different multidisciplinary artists together, like poets and um, sculptures and woodcutters and painters. So that started a whole new era for me. To try to find what you love about this, whether it's just in conservation or tied in with the arts, surround yourself with knowledgeable people. And, um, and don't forget, don't forget to push the envelope a little bit. Sometimes you have to take risks. Sometimes you, I mean, you have to have some failure to learn. Don't be afraid. Ask, ask the questions that are difficult. Um, take time to process the answers that you receive. And um, try to forge new territory by taking risks. That's what I would say. Don't play it safe. You gotta make change. Thank you. Thank you so much. So basically, um, that video was created by Dustin Angel, who is the education coordinator, the education director at Archbold. He did an amazing job and is actually a fantastic photographer as well. He did the Florida Stewart project and continues to work on that. So I wanna thank Dustin. Um, while I give you a little bit more about my background before we dive into those awesome videos in the field, I wanna let you know, you're just looking at some outreach slides from my past. Um, basically, I am a visual storyteller and I use the visual arts to enhance our understanding of why the environment is so vital to our health. Um, the presentation in and of itself is like a virtual exhibition. It's, it's acting as a way to experience the works virtually during the pandemic. And we're gonna alternate these videos with these slideshows just to give you that full picture. Um, this is an extension of my studio work. I started out by volunteering in national parks, then I moved on into education and taught for a while as an extension of my studio practice. And then I entered nonprofit, first volunteering, and then, as Hillary mentioned in her intro remarks, as the executive director for ARI for several years. Um, one little bit that cut off of that video, I think, mentioned that I did curate several exhibitions like you're seeing right now in the Airy Nest Gallery, which is still in the Ernest Coe Visitor Center in Everglades National Park, and I think it's opening up soon. Um, they've been closed, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. So, well, why art and science? Let's dive into that right now. My motivation as a conservation artist is to help preserve the environment for future generations. That's it. 
It's supported strongly by the fact that I'm a mother. I want to leave this place a better uh, planet for my son. Um, but additionally, I know that science can really help support that. That's why I'm leaning on the sciences to kind of support all of my, my own field work. Um, the research and management of our wild places does provide support for the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, and our water supply. So I think it really does affect everybody, no matter what you're doing in life, whether you're an artist or a scientist or just tuning in because you, you're curious today. Um, wild observations is also a way, a way to explore the intersection of art and science. The value of art is that it touches our heart and soul and can almost feel give people a visceral reaction sometimes if they see something strong that really touches them. Of course, science has the power and validity of the scientific method. So I do think they make good partners and we can talk about that a little bit more as the slideshow goes and as our panel discussion answers Q&A in the end. So a uh, quick note before we get rolling here, um, the show already was at Miami International Airport. It was seen by over 2.2 million viewers during the pandemic. Um, right now it's virtual with us here today and on my website. And then from May 6th to 27th, it's gonna be at the Sanger Gallery in Key West. Um, next winter in December, we're gonna open it at site-specific locations in Everglades National Park. So that will be like outside on trailheads, sides of buildings. So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, as we move forward, the talk is full of information, so I don't want to confuse you with so many visuals. Keep in mind um, that we are taking a cross-disciplinary approach. We have about five videos for you, and we broke it down into wetlands and water flow, uh, birds, um, pollinators and insects, and then conservation, ranch lands, and ultimately corridors with our super special guest, Joe Guthrie. So um, just before we, we watch this ranch wetlands video, I want you to think about wherever you're watching from today, how water flows, how that affects and how that connects everything. In the case of this video, we're looking at those lands just north of Lake Okeechobee on down to Everglades National Park, but the theory actually is valid for those other flyways and corridors. I'm thinking about the wetlands in Crested Butte near Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, and also in North Carolina where I went to a residency. So Laura and Margaret, why don't you roll that video? We are in this beautiful place today to talk about sheet flow. What can you teach me about it? Well, first of all, let's remember we're on a working cattle ranch right now. In fact, we just pashed a bunch of cows that were grazing in this pasture. And this is one of many, in fact, more than 600 seasonal wetlands. Can you see this sort of area of um, all of the this area of flower rich meadow is a is a wet prairie and if you had been here 50 or 100 years ago before some of the big drainage came into central and south florida actually more like 70 years ago this would all have been tied together as a giant sheet flow gently heading south uh, we have a big lake north of Clare called lake estapoga and then Lake Okeechobee south of here. And just like the Everglades was a river of grass, this too was a, a, a prairie, a prairie river. Some higher drier areas and then wet prairies like this. And during the wet season, it would have been up to the waist or knee deep, sheeting really, really slowly south. Um, a little higher areas, the water would have gone round them. And, uh, typical of these working ranches they have you know hundreds of these little just precious wetlands I always call them the little engines that can they're sort of these little hot spots of species and frogs and aquatic bugs and native plants a very rich diversity of native plants in these wetlands and especially in the wetlands um, that are in the more um, sort of less disturbed, less managed prairie. So on Buck Island Ranch, we have about half the ranch that is more intensively managed with lots of, you know, nutritional, uh, rich, rich nutritional grasses, mostly the hair. And then the rest of the ranches run more like a sort of half native, semi-native operation. 
with cattle grazing intermittently on during the winter season in places like this and then moving into the summer pastures in the dry, in the in the summer season so when you think about sheet flow when you're sitting in Miami thinking about sheet flow in the headwaters most people do not have this image in their mind at all i don't know what image they have in their mind but they don't have this image of these wonderful patchy little wetlands, intermediate pastures, all flowing south. Now, these are terrific sponges. They hold water and they release it slowly. And that, of course, is always the key for Okeechobee. You know, it's, it's the quantity as well as the quality of water that's coming down. Um, as we've intensified, uh, as we've put in development, and as we have some more intense areas in our cattle ranching operations, as well as these uh, semi-native areas, and as the big public work projects, the huge canals and ditches came in, the estimates are we're probably delivering 25% more water into the Okeechobee than we did when, when it ran like a sponge. This ran like a sponge. And it wasn't a limestone sponge like the Everglades. It's a sandy sponge, it's a sandy, acidic sponge, but it's the same thing, slow flow of water, really low gradient all the way down. We only have a six foot drop over six miles in this, on this uh, property. So to go back to your question, you know, how do we, how do we think about sheet flow? It's really hard to recreate the old, old sheet flow. We don't have a national park yet. We don't have hundreds of thousands of acres where we actually can have the whole system sheet. But each one of these big you know, sort of areas of cattle ranches is essentially a little mini sheet flow system. Sometimes actually the water comes back in from those ditches. It doesn't always go one way. So looking at how to manage sheet flow on a ranch, how to slow the flow, how to hold water back so these wetlands have got longer hydro periods, how to make sure, we're not wanting to turn this into a swimming pool, it's beautiful, it's a seasonal wetland, it's supposed to dry out and then flood, it's not supposed to be stacked up to here like some kind of reservoir swimming pool. These are living, breathing wetlands that need the right hydro period, not too much water and, and, and at least the, uh, more than uh, none. And this wetland, you can see it's quite variable, this is a grass here, maiden cane, it's um, actually a very nutritional grass. Um, our plant ecologist here, Betsy, always describes it as ice cream for cows. <laughs> and then um, we can also see some deeper areas. There's some soul grass. The same soul grass that you find in the Everglades is right here. There's a patch of it there, some there. I see some more soul grass in the middle. So lots of elements of Everglades plants that you would see in other places. And I'm sure if we ask Betsy later, she'll give you a very long list of some of the seasonal, uh, or some of the wetland um, wetland specialist plants we have in these areas. But um, yeah, sheep flow, it's hard to see, imperceptible amount of movement, but you're definitely standing in it. Oh, Hillary, I wish I was there with you right now. That just was such a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, I wanted to mention that some of those aerials that we just saw were provided um, via a flight with Lighthawk, which is an awesome conservation organization. Uh, I met them in the Everglades Coalition Conference a couple of years ago, and they've been so generous with some of their flights with myself and my fellows at Aries. So thank you everybody at Lighthawk and for all the work you do with the organizations. Um, Hillary, for those of us who, who are trying to understand more about that sheet flow and what services are provided by those, those ranches, can you give us a little overview of the ecosystem services of those types of environmental areas? Oh, well, that's a really easy question. Um, so we think of the typical uh, things of public value, all of the wildlife, everything from plants to bugs to large species. We also consider, you know, ecosystem services are, are things like uh, buffering from drought, uh, slowing down flooding, uh, make, uh, clearly uh, the sort of cleansing value of some of those more native areas, although we recognize that there are also disservices, areas that have had a lot of nutrient additions can be detracting from ecosystem services if they've had high fertilizer or other uses. So we have to, we're looking at trade-offs and synergies um, in terms of ecosystem services. You know, other very simple things. 
we don't think about natural areas as affecting the climate. But in fact, you know, the drainage of central Florida has resulted in colder winters with more freezes, or actually I should say winters with more cold, cold days and more freeze days because we lost the buffering effect of many of those wetlands as we drained them. So mm -hmm. the remaining natural areas have a lot of value for that. So, you know, I, um, Open space, um, you know, I've just been out for a walk with actually the one of the board, board of governors of the water management district just this, literally half an hour ago. She was in an absolute delight out here, uh, Charlotte Roman. So there's an ecosystem service. Persuade the water management district of the vast value of these big natural areas. Oh, we had a great time. So happy that you're doing that good work out there. And what a beautiful day to be in Archibald with this cold front that's come through. Well, um, just to inform our listeners, we have to stay a little bit on schedule. So we're just gonna talk for about a minute or so in between our videos for a while. And when Margaret and Laura put up the new video, that's our signal to kind of move it along. So this next one is a little longer. It's seven minutes in total with Dr. Reed Bowman, the avian ecologist at Archbold. Um, and essentially, you know, birds are really great indicators of biodiversity and Reed studies them all the time. I just wanted to give you the technical definition of ecosystem integrity. It's the ability of a system to retain its native biodiversity and ecological processes. So when we're talking about these birds, starting with extinct, moving into endangered and threatened, as you'll see, keep that in mind. It's very important for us to just maintain these ecosystems and improve them where necessary. Um, also, this was this video was created and helped, uh, helped me very much with my final project at the University of Florida's uh, uh, Master of Naturalist program that I'm taking. So thanks to everybody for your support. Let's roll it. Since we're going to be talking about this species, which is endangered, I thought maybe you could just tell us a little bit about those threats or comparisons to habitat with the red cockaded faces that unfortunately it looks like didn't work out for the ivory bill. Well, in a, in a way, the threats are the same. Um, loss of habitat, uh, increased fragmentation of what's left, so it makes it difficult for birds to move from one place to the other. In the case of the ivory bill, they needed much larger areas, um, and they also needed areas that were really remote. And so they were probably much more susceptible to fragmentation than the red cockaded woodpecker. But another component of that is fire mm -hmm. as well. So we don't know a huge amount about the natural history of the ivory bill woodpecker, but it does seem that they were fire dependent. And the red cockaded woodpecker is very fire dependent. Um, given the old growth forests that the ivory build with it, it could have been that fire was relatively infrequent, but it still reset the ecological succession that allowed ivory bills to exploit the habitat. Um, and again, the fire patterns have changed over millennia. And of course, the spread of fire changes when we fragment the habitat because fires just can't continuously burn. So, Th those are exactly the same threats that face red cockaded woodpeckers. Now, red cockaded woodpeckers depend on much more frequent fire. Every two to three years, it's necessary for RCWs to be able to thrive in those habitats. So that's just an amazing amount of information. I feel like I just read a whole <laughs> book. But there is one really interesting component that I think the general public would like to know about. I mean, they might be thinking, why is it so important to save this bird other than the obvious reasons? And something I read that really interested me is those cavities can be reused by so many species. I mean, we were talking earlier that bats were found in one. Right. I mean, don't snakes go in there? Tell me a little bit more about the cavities. Yeah, so the cavity is a resource. Um, only the RCWs are capable of excavating a cavity in a living pond. It takes them years to do it because in order to make a cavity in the heartwood, you have to go through the sapwood. Well, the sapwood is producing resin constantly. So they work a little bit and then stop, let all the resin harden, then work a little bit more. Once that cavity is there, heartwood of these old growth pines is like cement. It's, it's unbelievably hard. So that cavity persists for a long time. 
Lots of other bird species use those cavities. Um, flying squirrels might use those cavities. And when I say use, sometimes they're actually competing with the red cockaded woodpecker for those cavities. Um, but in general, that improves the health of the entire community to have the RCWs there. And, and to me, the most important thing is that you have to have old growth forests to do that. So old growth forests themselves, whether or not you have RCWs or not, are important to a lot of different species. What they do have in common is this mating system called cooperative breeding, where the young birds remain with their parents for a year or longer and actually assist their parents with raising their siblings. And so there is a lot more sociality within these family groups in cooperative breeders than there are in other species. Um, so, but the red cockaded woodpecker is a great example of a species that's been threatened by human activities. It's a species that we're also able to manage very effectively. So it depends on frequent fire. We can do that with prescribed fire. But it also depended on old growth forests because old growth forests have these old, old pine trees that have been attacked by a fungus that softens the heartwood in the middle of that pine. Mm -hmm. So the red cockaded woodpecker is the only North American woodpecker to excavate its cavities in living pine trees. Some of the rarest birds, you can see them right here on the ranch. I mean, we're Caracara cara is a falcon, quintessentially found in Florida ranches. Very common here. We have about 10 breeding pairs and a big um, and intermittently a large number of non-breeding or juveniles will roost on the ranch. And um, you can certainly see it in the collection. Um, but you know, a typical caracara will be out here in the territory, you know, a few hundred acres, does lots of things, walks around, flips cow patties, picks beetles from underneath them, you know, finds a dead catfish, uh, maybe, you know, finds a calf, that, uh, um, a cow that's just given birth to a calf and, you know, picks its way through the afterbirth. None of this is really pleasant, but it's a lot of food out there for a caracara. Cara. And of course they will also go after injured or um, you know sick animals, they will eat them as well. So there's a there's a wonderful falcon, only found in central Florida, threatened species. You can see it in our collection, but if we drive down the road I bet we'll see one now. And they're often in these improved pastures. In fact, they actually have higher densities in the highly managed pastures, which are super productive, um, you know, with more nutrition than they do in the more native grasslands. But the juveniles will form huge roosts where they come and spend the night. Um, sometimes some of those roosts have been more than 100 birds. Wow! Um, and we don't really know the function of those roosts. There, there, there's a variety of different ideas. It could be about information sharing about foraging. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a way to meet potential mates and, right. and figure out who's going to mate where. Because um, these birds are not migratory. Now some, some species like swallowtail kites form these big roosts right before they migrate. But these birds are year-round residents. Mm. Um, so they don't migrate. So it's probably not anything about following individuals to the winter. Ground. One of the big threats though, is that many of the pastures are shifting. You know, ranch lands are disappearing as well. Um, and they are either being replaced by development or they're being displaced by more intense monocultural agriculture like sugarcane. Um, so there are still threats of habitat loss, even though this bird seems to thrive in the typical Florida ranch landscape. Thank you. I want to give a quick shout out also to biologist Jessica Spickler, who's with us today. Um, Jessica took me out to Big Cypress. You'll see in some of the pictures here in the slideshow. And one of them is actually a little video is it this one? It's this one right here. And you can see that little red carcated woodpecker popping into its cavity for the evening. It was, again, a transformative moment. So thank you, Jessica. Well, Reed, um, I think if you could answer uh, 
chat with me for just about a minute on the value of those old growth forests and maintaining those special habitats that are full of saw palmettos for species like the red cockaded woodpecker. That would be great. Well, I mean, those old growth forests are amazing. Um, they are burned incredibly frequently. But remember, these are very low intensity fires. So really all they're doing is burning the understory. And when you go into those forests, you have these enormously large regal trees, but underneath you've got grass and very sparse palmetto, and it supports a huge diversity of birds. I and mean, in fact, when you walk into a pine forest like that, there's a bunch of different species that you're gonna see right off the bat. Things like the brown-headed nuthatch, which is another really interesting cooperative breeder that, that makes this high chittering noise up in the trees. To me, it's a, it's a rare habitat and it's a rare environment in which you can enjoy what historic Florida used to look like. Um, I think that's a perfect segue into our follow-up video that's called Bird Communication, as everybody can see on their screen. But Reed, what I love about this so much is when you start to talk about Don Chorus, and I think most people can relate to, to that wherever you are, maybe unless you're in an intensely urban environment. For me, it's seven o'clock here in Miami Beach in the morning. That's when all the birds wake up and they just chatter and I can hear it. And this is one of my favorite sections. So please roll the video, Laura and Margaret, and let's see what Reed has to say. Jays, jays have lots of communication. Um, you know, we don't think of corvids as having particularly rich songs, but they have lots of different calls. And, um, and they do have a song. It's just what we would call a whisper song. It's really, really, you can barely hear it. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of meaning in all those different calls and they're also sometimes context specific so it may mean one thing in one context in a different social context it might mean something else um, and the other thing that's really important about communication is that we talk about J calls um, and that all the J's around know that so those are territorial calls that's a chase actually a bird chasing another bird um, but now all the neighbors heard that, mm -hmm. right? So the neighbors now know there's some kind of disruption going on in this territory. So for example, when a jay dies, right? And let's say the male dies. Um, suddenly the young males, if he has any older, uh, older sons, are gonna become very, very defensive. And all that defensive noise is heard by the other jays. That's a disruption in the social fabric of all the jays. Within hours after a jay dies, potential replacements start showing up. I mean, they immediately know that something has happened. They're going to go find out what it was. And if it's relevant to them, like, oh, here's an opportunity for me to become a breeder, uh -huh. they're going to stick around and do that. So we know that other species actually learn and know the meaning of signals within and among the jays. So, for example, um, we studied towhees for a little while to see whether towhees recognized the alarm calls that jays give and if it affects their behavior. And it did both. Um, so not only did they recognize the alarm calls, um, so they hide if jays give an alarm call, but the towhees that are foraging near jays spend less time being vigilant. You know, so a, a towhee is on the ground, right? Its head, head positions are either I'm eating or I'm looking for a predator, right? But if the jays are around, they don't look up nearly as frequently as if a jay's not around because they're counting on the jays to, to do that, right? Amazing. And uh, a, a colleague of mine who used to work here at Archibald, Keith Tarvin, has been doing the same thing with blue jays and squirrels, seeing if they if the squirrels recognize some of the cues that the blue jays are doing, and they do. so. Um, so we think about this communication network, it's not just among jays, it's a network that crosses species. And so, so when you think about it, you know, you go out for dawn chorus and it sounds beautiful, you know, have all these birds singing and stuff. Think about it from a slightly different perspective. There's information with all that, all those sounds that you're hearing. And to me, that's sort of the heart of being a biologist is 
you know, seeing something or hearing something as beautiful as Dawn Chorus, and then asking the question, why? What are, what are they communicating? Why are they communicating it? How are they communicating it? And how are people? How are other individuals receiving it? And I mean, that's not my area of expertise, but it's just fascinating. You know? So it's a huge world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. Um, I wanted to say to our audience, because I don't think I mentioned it in the beginning, that Dustin actually shot all of this on a Google Pixel. So kudos to him. It was so much fun to be in the field with him and just have the, everything done on the little pixel. It was, it was amazing. Um, also, I wanted to mention that the whole reason I discovered Archbold is because Paul Gray of Audubon was very generous with his time. I was working on a, a project, a book project, and I contacted him because I realized I didn't know much about that greater Everglades region that's north of Lake Okeechobee. And there he is, Paul took us out on, on the airboat and explained everything to me. There's Paul too. So I wanted to thank him for that introduction because he's the one that said, let's go over and, and introduce you to Archibald. So that was very meaningful. Um, Read the, the takeaway for me on that segment is all about joy. It, it really is because when I'm in the field and with birds, I just get that feeling, that connection with living things, watching them fly, thinking about how they migrate. This is all um, figuring more prominently into the work I'm preparing now for the Key West show. Is there anything you would like to add to this concept of um, finding joy in your hikes and your work? Well, I mean, as scientists and as artists, you're, we're trained to observe. Um, and, you know, I, I often ask my question, my students, go out in the field and watch, because inevitably you'll see something you don't understand. And that always raises the question. And for a scientist, that's a question that we want to answer. For an artist, perhaps that's a question that you want to express in some, some artistic visual way. Um, so I think you have to be open to what you see and what you understand and what you don't understand is equally interesting and important. Um, be open to it always. Uh, and like you said in your introduction, don't be afraid to push the envelope a little bit. You know, it's all right to get down on your hands and knees and stick your head in a hole and you know, really explore the outdoors. That's so true. I want to mention that last slide on the show was taking, uh, taken over at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. Ian Billick does an amazing job at running those programs, and especially during the summer, they have tons of uh, seminars and workshops that you can, can attend. I was very lucky to visit them out there. Like all of these places, I want to recommend that you contact them ahead of time because of the pandemic. So many are closed right now. Um, so, as you can see, we're almost ready to roll this one with Dr. Mark Darup, where we talk about pollination and moth biodiversity. Um, as you look at it, just remember that birds and insects are really the great connectors. So let's watch this one. Okay, Mark, I'm super excited to talk about moths with you now. And the reason is, um, a couple of years ago when I was here, you generously showed me this tray of moths and I found them so beautiful. People typically think of butterflies as being the big showy um, uh, pollinator to look at and invite to our garden, but moths are so fascinating. So after I left you, I made some negatives of that image and then overlaid it in this cyan type print that I make sometimes here at Archbold or while I'm at other residencies. Cyanotypes are interesting because they're sort of like fun, immediate prints you can do on location when you don't have a printer or a lab nearby. And you can also experiment with this different type of foliage. I think this was Beautyberry, for example. So at some point, we're trying to match the pollinators with the botany that they love. And it's just a, a, a beautiful um, exercise, I, I guess, in creative process. So this image ended up a bit of a backdrop. In, in this um, ghost orchid image that's in Wild Observations. And also, um, a variation of that cyanotype print ended up um, printed on aluminum over text about the importance of pollinators and the food we eat 
in Spanish. So I was hoping <laughs> if today you could talk a little bit about pollinators, um, and specifically moths if you would like, and how important they are to our ecosystem integrity. Okay, well, every flower you see that has color or fragrance is depending on insects. So, and that's most flowers. So, insects are incredibly important for flowers of all different kinds. And in the case of moths, moths are like the new frontier of pollination because we know very little about what moths do because obviously they do it at night. Mm -hmm. So bees, you can go and sit and watch, but moths, they're out there at night. If you show a light, they fly to the light, so they're not doing their thing. And so it's very hard to observe moths. And, but we know that there are a lot of them out there. So butterflies are good pollinators, and you see them on flowers, but butterflies are a small group. So here at the station, we have about 60 species of butterflies, and about 1,200 species of moths. So there are a lot of moths around. And if you look at them, like any of these moths, if you look at them underneath, you see a long coiled tongue. And that means that they're visiting flowers. So every one of those thousand species of moths are probably doing things out there. Mm -hmm. And we have no idea what it is. But now and then somebody does some research at night, somebody who's more nocturnal than I am, or most, most biologists, and so the work with the ghost orchid was done by somebody who was both nocturnal and had the technical expertise to do photographs of moths flying at night. So you see this moth static, you see that moth static, okay. you see this moth static, but this moth's wings were flying, moving so fast, they were just a blur. And only modern cameras can catch that. Mm -hmm. So that moth here is this one here. That was really just such a treat to be able to speak with um, Dr. Dayrup. He has since uh, retired, I believe, at Archbold, but still returns frequently for things like this and to, uh, to get together with his lab. Um, I wanna mention that the whole ghost orchid experience is so interesting because I got to go out initially with Mike Owens during my residency in Big Cyprus. Subsequently met a friend named Jay Staten who takes me out every now and then. So I thank them very much. Um, Hillary, is there anything you would like to add to um, the slideshow images at this point? I know we talked a little bit about the importance yeah. of pollinators, but I'd like to hear your point of view on this. Well, first of all, I'm an extremely poor substitute for Mark Dayrup. You're all being very short-changed, but I'll do my <laughs> best. And what I know I'd largely learned from Mark. Um, I think the thing which didn't come over so much in that is that there are the big showy moths, like the, you know, the, the, um, the, the sphinx moths that you just saw, and the five species that are going to the ghost orchid. And then, you know, and they're sometimes called hawk moths or, um, uh, you know, clear wings or sphingid moths. They have lots of names, hummingbird moths, because they're so big and obvious. But the vast, vast majority of moths are in the micro leps, really small. And that makes understanding their role even more difficult. Um, so, uh, yeah, yes, and moths, you know, have so many ecosystem roles. I mean, there are moths with aquatic larvae, that are, there are clothes moths that are recycling, you know, sort of tortoise shell shells. I, I think what I want to talk about is the diversity of moths and the diversity of functions they have above and beyond the incredible pollinators. And just that, you know, like, just like the beetles, so the big showy ones and uh, there are the you know many many hard-working small beetles and that is also true for the moths the micro laps are just really a, um, of enormous interest and enormous value and largely unknown and the new technologies are giving us ways to do this we can look at a pollen grain from a moth and uh, start to identify who, which plant it has visited from that pollen grain. The cap, the camera traps, the video traps are really expanding. So I'll stop there. But um, sorry, guys, you really would have been better off with Mark. Oh, but that's really exciting. Now I have something to look at next time I come back with the little pollen grains. That's and good segue. Something we didn't mention was there was a video called Travel Invasives because 
this little teeny tiny beetle called the ambrosia beetle has really decimated the, the bay trees in certain areas. And although today's talk is, is heavy into art and science, we can't overlook the cultural aspects and, and specifically the Miccosukee tribe relied so much on that bay leaf for their cultural practices. And now because of this one little invasive beetle, they can't really apply those, those leaves to their practices anymore. So that's something for us to think about too. And I also wanna mention to everybody who's tuning in, at the end, I believe we have a list of um, some websites and resources for you, and you'll be able to check those out if you're interested in, in joining any groups. Like um, there are events all the time that are based on Facebook. I think there's a prayer walk coming up soon for Lake Okeechobee. So we're looking at a ranch land conservation video still. Um, what are we doing for this one? We're, we're thinking a little bit about archives and conservation and maybe some collections work in there. Um, let's roll it and talk about it after, shall we? Or, or what can we do to make sure that we will have these areas moving forward into the next generation? Well, one of the challenges for a little wetland like this is it's not a huge extensive wetland. Some of them are below regulatory size. You know, a lot of the wetland regulations are to deal with big marshes. When you've got, we have 600 little wetlands like this on the ranch. They're only connected when it's extremely wet and the water sheeting between them. In fact, actually, we sometimes want them to be isolated because we want the water to gather in them. As the dry season comes on, that water gets concentrated and then you'll come out here and there'll be 50 great egrets yeah. and some woodstock. So it's concentrating the fish just like you would find in the Everglades. But these seasonal wetlands, they're seasonal. They're not flooded year round, they're not permanently flooded. So we actually, what we do want to do is make sure that they're protected within the landscape. What we don't want to do is dredge them all together because that is undesirable. The, the way they functioned, you have more frogs here when this wetland is, um, uh, is wet but not connected by a big ditch um, or not connected by huge sheet flow under very wet conditions because frogs, um, you know, little tadpoles and things are eaten by fish. Mm -hmm. So if you have fish moving to an area then you lose some, not all of your frogs. So, and you know, the other frogs out here, I mean, there's a plethora of frogs on Buck Island Ranch, but this is the sort of perfect place for frogs because we've got little hammocks all the way around it. So all the tree frogs love little patches of woodland next to, uh, next to a small uh, or a seasonal wetland. So think about this, that you're really not managing for one thing. You're not just managing for wetlands. You're not managing it at one time because you might, might want it to be wet sometimes, dry other. And you're not managing for exactly the same spatial configuration all the time. When I mean the layout of the landscape matters a lot. And you're managing that matrix. It's the matrix, the interspersion. People get over focused, they're over focused on just the wetland without realizing it's the adjacent upland and the nearby hammock. I love places where you can actually just keep looking in, into the horizon. And this is an example of that. So a lot of the working cattle ranches in Florida are roadless. It took us quite a while to get here. So we're a long way from a main road. And that's really important for these large roaming animals. And it might be a bobcat, it might be a otter, it might be a bear, it might be a panther. These spaces give them room to set up territories because they have very big territory sizes, uh, space to breed and overwinter, and then particularly for males, room to roam. <laughs> males are always roaming, <laughs> looking for mates. So when you see a ranch like this, uh, there's, there's, you know, someone, a rancher, someone like Gene Lawless, our ranch manager, uh, someone once said to me, the thing I admire about ranches is they think at the scale of a bear. I thought about that, I thought that's rather nice. So they manage land at the sort of same scale, 10,000 acres, 20,000 acres, that is the size of some of the territories of these large animals. So they understand the need for space, they have big operations, and they understand that an animal they may say he, see here might be on their neighbor's land later on. So the key thing, is we cannot protect large area requiring species on small or not so large, you know, small or medium sized conservation plants. We have to have the matrix in between. And if that matrix is a subdivision, that's the death knell, literally for large animals. 
If the matrix is something like this, a working farm or a ranch, there's lots of possibilities. This is perfectly good habitat. Uh, so one of the things I like to think about when I look out here is I have no expectation or a low expectation of seeing something like a big predator. I have a, yeah, I have a easy expectation of seeing a feral swine or a common species like white-tailed deer and I wouldn't be surprised at all if we didn't see some turkeys today. But um, one of the great things is a lot of those large area animals move around at night. And so observations of them have just skyrocketed with the new camera, tra new sort of automated camera traps. So if you ask me how are, um, how are large area requiring animals doing in Florida, we're doing well because we still have spaces like this between all of our wonderful parks and conservation lands. We will not do well if we lose these spaces, if they're no longer economically viable. And we will certainly not do well if we keep cutting them up with major roads that end up as significant barriers. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary, for that amazing day. Um, before we transition to the next chat, a couple things I want to mention that really weren't clear in the video is that collections like what you're seeing right now are super important for scientists and artists in the general public. Some of these images, like these ones, are taken from the South Florida Collections Management Center, which is located in Everglades National Park. Of course, because of the pandemic, kind of closed to the public right now, but you could contact their limited staff and see if your research project could be approved. Um, I also included a map from History Miami Museum, and there are some images all throughout the presentation from the collections at Archbold. So thank those great institutions, because otherwise, as things wash away, get demolished, or become threatened and endangered and maybe extinct, what record do we have? So that's really important in that sense to me. Um, so thinking about the larger mammals to me, it's like chasing the Holy Grail. I saw a few panther, a few um, bears at Archbold last season. So that was super exciting for me. And it kind of gave life to a, a piece I call um, Ursus Americanus. I'm not sure that we had it in the slideshow, uh, but it is essentially where I overlaid data from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission report in 2019 over a photograph of a bear skull loaned to me from the education department. So that was really informative to my own work. I do a lot of data overlay in my work. I love that. It's kind of like a learning tool for me. Um, so that was very important. But beyond that, I would say you have to do the work. You have to get in the field. And that's how you're going to have those tran transformative moments of of maybe seeing a large mammal. Um, for me, watching an elk fall asleep in North Carolina two years ago during a, a field station residency, which is now called Brighter Impacts. It was uh, art science in the field at the time. That experience was just life-changing. I held my breath as his whole rack fell over and he fell asleep in the forest. So moments like that wanna, wanna just keep me going always to, to kind of highlight the challenges that we have with our environment through the arts. So Hillary, are you there? There's a picture of the elk. That's, I love that. If you're online there, Hillary, I, I wanted to say this might be an awesome time to go ahead and introduce our special guest whose work transitions um, from, we we're talking about the larger mammals into the wild wildlife corridor for Florida. So, sure. Yeah. So I'll be happy to do that, of course. Um, so Archfold's very, um, I'm very happy to welcome Joe Guthrie back to our science staff. Joe was here as a graduate student many years ago, um, following on a long tradition of work on large area requiring species. Um, and he has come back here to start um, head up a new program called our Predator Prey Program. And I think by way of introduction, um, he did his graduate work at University of Kentucky with Dave Mayer. Uh, by way, of, I'm just going to let him talk about two or three slides here and introduce himself as he talks about the work. So, and think a little bit about what we said about connectivity early, uh, earlier on and how it relates to what he's going to talk about. So over to you, Joe, and it's really super to have you back at Archfold. Thank you, Hillary. Good to see you and good to see you, Deborah. Um, as, you're, as Hillary was saying, uh, my time at Archfold comes after an eight year long experience tracking 
uh, the movements and conservation of, of the Florida black bear in Highlands and Glades County, which is which is where Archbold is uh, based in Highlands County. Um, this is a collaborative project, as as Hillary mentioned, with the University of Kentucky. Um, we were using GPS collars to understand how the black bear really uses the landscape. So we we sought a kind of understanding about um, where they exist here and, and how many persist in this kind of small pocket of South Central Florida, which is, as we know, is really dominated by agriculture and, and mostly privately owned. Our tracking effort um, showed us the role of so-called wildlife corridors in, in stitching together the landscape of South Central Florida. And you can, you know, it's illustrated in the map on the left side of the screen here uh, of a bear we uh, affectionately coined uh, M34. Uh, who went on a, about a two month long walkabout in the summer of 2010 that took them from uh, the center of the map around Sebring all the way to the northern extent of the map, which is Orlando, and then back down the Kissimmee uh, River, uh, the restored section of the Kissimmee River, all the way to Lake Okeechobee, which you can see in the bottom right of that map, um, and a distance of over 500 miles in just a couple of weeks. Um, so uh, next slide, please, Margaret. Um, the, the the effort to um, identify wildlife corridors for bears and highlands in Glades County really propelled for me an interest in ecological corridors at a at a much larger scale, namely the entire state of Florida, from Everglades National Park uh, in the south to Georgia and Alabama in the north. And so it was after finishing graduate school at, at Kentucky that I helped uh, launch a project with my colleagues, uh, Mallory Dimmitt and Carlton Ward and, and our colleague Tom Hochter at the University of Florida um, that we, we called the Florida Wildlife Corridor, which is a vision for a connected statewide network of public and private conservation land. It's, it's based on years of science that uh, Tom Hochter and others uh, at University of Florida, like Reed Noss, uh, at, who's at University of Central Florida, but uh, Larry Harris, also at the University of Florida, um, kind of following up on that years of research into what it would take to protect a, a connected network um, across the state. Next slide, please. So now I'm, I'm back at Archbold, uh, very fortunate to be back at Archbold um, to lead a new program called the Predator Prey Program. Um, we'll, we'll begin our work with really broad questions like what is the role of predators in Florida's natural and, and working landscapes? Our work is uh, directly tied into the role the wildlife corridors play in maintaining the ecological integrity that, that Deborah uh, defined for us earlier. This is relevant, especially in, in human dominated landscapes where natural habitat may be managed for agriculture or, or recreation, or, or quite often it gets changed wholesale for development such as, as roads or, or residential neighborhoods. Um, next slide, please. So we know that, um, that many mammal predators species are present in the landscape, but we, though we know that we may not have a very good idea of how commonly they occur or how, how their abundance uh, may change from habitat type to habitat type. So we're interested in trying to understand that uh, abundance, particularly for uh, predator species um, and how it changes across the landscape. Um, we'll, one of our kind of beginning steps in this is going to be to use carefully designed arrays of remote game cameras um, kind of depicted on, on the right hand side of the screen here. Um, this will help us derive estimates of the abundance and density of, our, of some of our target species. Um, and, and that's a really important step in, in assessing these the relationships and what influence um, the landscape has on relationships among predators and prey. Um, next slide, please. And then, um, you know, also among the, the first steps here, um, we'll be revisiting some of the, the bear data that's archived at, at Archbold um, to identify road crossing hotspots across the network of roads in South Central Florida here. Um, and, and the idea there is that, you know, if we can uh, reduce mortality in highly mobile species like, uh, like black bears, um, we can probably uh, imagine we'll do the same for some smaller species, but also, you know, smaller, but also fairly wide ranging, relatively wide ranging species like 
bobcat or, or the spotted skunk uh, you see on the top top right here. Uh, the map on the left, just so you know, is uh, shows where we think road crossings are well, where road crossings are are shown from our bear GPS data, just at Archbold. You can see Archbold. Uh, labeled in the fine print um, there at the at juncture of State Road 70, which cuts across the state east and west, and US 27, uh, which is a major uh, uh, federal highway that, that cuts north and south um, down, the, down the center of the state. Um, and so yeah, and you, hopefully most people on the call or on, the, uh, on our feed will recognize Lake Annie um, here very near the crossroads. Um, so that's, uh, those are the areas that we're going to focus our, our work here at the, the start of the predator prey program. Next slide, please. And I thought it would be appropriate at the end of our discussion about the, you know, exploring the crossover between art and nature to, to share a little video of one of our neighbors doing a sort of interpretive dance. Um, so the, the <laughs> spotted skunk there. <laughs> That's their threat display. When they're, they're nervous about something, they will uh, do a the cutest possible handstand. Cheers. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank, thank you. you. I, I think at this point, as I look at the clock nervously, we just have a couple of minutes left for some Q&A. And we were going to get Hillary and Reed back on the screen to hear um, Laura, if there's anything else we want to cover from our audience today. You do have a few questions. We have one from Dr. Fitzpatrick, our board member. He says, Deborah, I'm curious, do you practice plein air techniques among your repertoire of connecting art with science and natural places? So thank you, Fitz. And I must say my, um, my endangered uh, species cabinet was inspired by your talk, your eBird talk that you gave via Archbold. I think it was last summer, so thank you for that. Plain air techniques. I would love to do more of that. I think that's wonderful. For unfortunately, time seems to always be in short supply, and that's why camera has um, been my best friend the last 20 years or so, because I get out there, I take the images, then go back to my studio, write and record everything in my journal, draw a little, paint a little. Typically the larger paintings are done in my studio, but those cyanotypes have been fabulous to do in the field. As you saw from that little video, I did that when I was um, actually at Archbold. So cheers to more plain air, but thus far I have not been very successful at that. All right, thank you. And the next one I believe was referring to something that Reed spoke about, how much old growth forests still exist in Florida? Well, the, the longleaf pine ecosystem, which used to cover the vast majority of the Southeast has been reduced by over 95%. Um, I don't know how much specifically in Florida because we do have some very large areas in Florida that have been preserved like Eglin Air Force Base and Ocala National Forest um, and uh, Osceola National Forest. So um, there's still a bunch of it. A lot of it is protected, but it has been tremendously reduced. All right, the next one is actually from Paul Gray that you talked about. I don't know if you noticed that he's on. And he asked, what is the cockade? Would you explain that? Well, the cockade, of course, the cockade was a, a feather that colonial men would put in their hat on the side. And on the red cockaded woodpecker, it is a few little feathers that are on the side of the head. They're almost invisible in the field. You, you almost rarely see it, um, but it develops early on. And we're actually able to differentiate the males from the females um, by a little patch of red on their head even when they're nestlings. Only the males have the red cockade, the females don't. All right, the next question is, what's the biggest thing that the average Florida resident can do to help protect the matrix of land so vital to the environment? That's a big one. Well, maybe I could have a go at it, um, but I'll be happy, uh, Joe and Reed, if you want to chip in. Um, Supporting efforts for land conservation, land and water conservation is the most overarching thing. So 
this would be state acquisition of not just fee simple, that means direct purchase by the state of parks and protected areas, but increasingly the application of state money for buying what are called easements or basically buying development rights on working farms and ranches in Florida and working forest systems. So supporting those programs, sometimes under Florida Forever, there's a whole slew of them with different names, telling your legislators that these are really, really important and that you really uh, you want some commitment to them. And the other thing is, um, for those of you with sufficient fortitude, and it takes a lot, attending county commission meetings and keeping a real eye on land use and land zoning changes. It's amazing, you know, that a little bit of pressure and a little suggestion and a little passion can go a long way at a local level. Many, many, you know, all politics is local, most conservation is local. And anything that you can say at one of those county commission meetings, and if you turn up to all of them, just turn up to all of them so they know there's always going to be a voice for conservation, it surprisingly does make a difference. And the more people there are who do that, the better it is. Because I can assure you, there's a multitude of people that argue in favor of extensive development. There is room for both. There is room for both. But, you know, uh, uh, development in the right place and conservation in the right place. All right. Thank you, Hillary. And to expand on that, we have another question. Besides supporting the organizations that Deborah mentioned, what can a layperson do to support pollinators and migratory species? Well, I can jump in and, and just speak from a layman's turn because I have just done this recently. I thought I had almost like a xeric landscaping in, in my yard around our home in Miami Beach that didn't require much water. But after taking a couple of these courses from Master Naturalist, I have started making my own bird and butterfly gardens with all native species. So they say if you plant 70% native, you don't have to go 100, that would be daunting, but 70%, you'll really support your local birds and bees and butterflies. And already, I just did this in November, we have seen so, so many more visitors to our yard. So that's a very easy thing to do. You just have to stop going to your large big box stores and go to your individual nurseries that are selling those native species. And it's fun, super fun. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, all right. Joe, what is the status of the spotted skunk in Florida? Well, um, the status of the spotted skunk. So the, um, the spotted skunk is known pretty well on the Florida um, peninsula. I think there's less known about it on the, on the panhandle. Um, and, and certainly what we, I think we've seen in the research is that there's some areas on the, on the panhandle that where they're, I'm sorry, on the on the peninsula where they're quite locally abundant. I think Reed can probably can probably back that up. Um, but their um, their status is their legal status is they're 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 legally trapped. It's legal to trap uh, spotted skunks in in Florida. Um, but there's there's currently no ongoing um, dedicated uh, monitoring effort. There are some recent there's some recent data from uh, uh, David Joukowsky and his master student Stephen Harris at um, at Clemson, um, and I think there may be and there may be some other an, another paper that I'm not aware of um, uh, from from somewhat recently. But um, those are that that's the most recent data that have been published. Um, so I'm actually very interested in 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 kind of seeing we, if we can. Um, look into some of that, some of those questions about their status and, and local hotspots around this part of the world. I might add to that, that um, some of that work was done at Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area where they recorded very high densities of spotted skunk. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of good historical data to know what is a natural level for spotted skunks. However, the very high populations of spotted skunks there now have been implicated in nest predation on the Florida grasshopper sparrow, which is probably the rarest of all our Florida birds. So, um. yeah, it's it's a it's a funny dynamic. Most of the rest of the, you know, uh, kind of continental distribution of spotted skunk, the bio biologists are very worried about uh, their seeming collapse in their populations and trying to figure out where they're distributed now. But um, in Florida, they they uh, are. Uh, seem to do quite well in these these dry prairies. All right, we have a couple of questions from Facebook. 
To Joe, what are your first main objectives for your program? Well, first objective is to publish some of the existing bear data. Um, we've got to get that out. I, I know Reed and Hillary are probably tiring of hearing me talk about it, um, but we've got to get those those data out. Um, and um, and because it's just it's a pressing it's a pressing one. We we we're um, we want to be able to identify hot spots in the roads where bears are likely to cross roads and 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 maybe getting um, killed by cars. And so we want to get those those data out. And I think. Um, also, we're going to start um, with camera traps, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, to try and get some just some basic population uh, abundance and density numbers on some of the species that have, haven't been monitored uh, here at Archbold for for many years. Um, so that that that's really it. Uh, get get going and and get some get a little data out and and then start a couple of uh, start a couple of field based projects that we can that we can follow on with uh, for many years. Thank you. We are so excited about that. We have another one from Facebook for Reed. What is the red cockaded woodpecker population? Oh, I should know this right off the top of my head, but I, the number's going to fail me. They, they actually have, have grown quite a bit and stabilized in the last 10, 15 years to the point that they've been downlisted from endangered to threatened. And that's largely because um, they're doing extremely well on the public lands that have instituted what we call the, the basic tripod of management for red cockaded woodpeckers. Ra frequent fires, managing the cavities by creating artificial cavities, and occasionally moving birds among populations to either help a population grow more rapidly or for genetic reasons. And because of that, we have relatively healthy populations of grass of uh, red cockaded woodpeckers, whether or not they can actually move from population to population is still dependent on the establishment of corridors that birds use too. And I think um, Reed that Jessica has some great papers on that. So if you go to Jessica Spickler at Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation, she's done a lot of work on translocation, very successful translocation work. So you could Google her and ask her that question. For some reason, I'm thinking 7,000 or 7,000 pairs is sticking in my mind, Reed. I don't know if that's the number you were thinking. And of course, it depends if we define it from Georgia or South Carolina all the way down to Florida or just Florida. Right. Yeah, Jessica uh, worked for us on our red cockaded woodpecker work. Yeah. All right. The next question is for Hillary. Is genuine interest expressed other than by conservationists in trying to provide glades restoration north of Lake O? Seems like everything is directed to the south after much damage is done. Um. I would say the professional uh, conservation community, the, the big conservation organizations, um, you know, sort of the Nature Conservancy, Audubon of Florida, uh, Defenders of what, uh, Florida's Defender of Wildlife, all, all of the big ones are, are very knowledgeable about the importance of what we call the headwaters of the Everglades. Um, I think the challenge is getting public support for that area because we have a very low population density in it. And it's really hard to make the connection for those on the coast to that inland area, as especially as many coastal areas downstream perceive the interior of the state as a source of all water quality problems, where we actually know this whole, the water quality issues on the coast are very, very real, very, very serious, but very complicated and not so easy just to point the finger in one direction. So I would say, yes, we have really struggled. There's very little SERP activity north of the lake. Um, obviously, the Kissimmee restoration has been one of the few exceptions, one of the remarkable exceptions in that. Um, we are fortunate that the USDA and, uh, and the state actually has put a lot of conservation funding into this area, but we're just not heavily populated, so we don't have enough voices. The Florida Wildlife Corridor, the emerging corridor that Joe is talking about, is very focused on this area because without it, there is no connectivity from South Florida to North Florida. So um, I think a shout out to all of you to um, you know speak up, you know, Archbold Station and the ranch, we're all part of the headwaters of 
of the Everglades. We're all part of that big ecosystem. And protecting the entire ecosystem from, um, from Orlando down to Okeechobee is very important. So you are right, it has been very hard to get sufficient public support, but there is a broad recognition in the conservation community. Uh, there is the other challenge that, you know, there's such huge demands, um, especially in the sort of South Florida area for Everglades restoration, all perfectly, perfectly justified. But it is hard to get that water restoration money moved north of the lake where it could do, um, where it is sorely needed as well. I don't know if that answers your question, Pat. <laughs> you and I should probably have a chat about that sometime. It's nice to have you on the call. All right, it is 4.45, so I'm just yeah, going to check in with all of you guys if you want to keep going or call it a day. I, I, I'm going to take director prerogative here and say that I'm just amazed how many of you have hung on, and those were wonderful questions. And I'd like to uh, say that we're going to draw this to a close. If there are still questions in the Q&A, we'll, be, we'll uh, respond by email and let you know. We, we do have your contact information. I also wanted to uh, sincerely thank Deborah. This was a wonderful idea. And the fact that we've got a good crowd uh, 15 minutes late is a very good sign of how compelling this was. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of Archbold. Thank you for thinking for this wonderful idea. Big shout out to uh, Dustin and to Margaret in education and to Laura, you know, these behind the scene things for, um, for, for Zoom meetings are not trivial, we, uh, we appreciate it. And I, I think on behalf of the Archfold staff and also for Joe and uh, Reed and Mark, it was a great pleasure to work with you, Deborah. And we just look forward to this continuing and wish you luck for your next shows and see you here soon. Thank you, thank you all so much. I really, really appreciate your work and let's just keep it going, let's keep it going. So...